Well, let me just say a couple of things. This, of course, is we, uh, this is month number six of our nine month season that began in September and runs through May. So we're two thirds of the way through. And uh, we already have put out a notice calling for abstracts uh, for next year's presentations. So uh, if anybody uh, would like to participate, please send Bob and I an abstract of uh, a research presentation. I think we set up about an early May or mid-May uh, deadline for that. So uh, either Bob or I will be glad to uh, uh, accept those abstracts. And we already have a handful in already, so we're very happy about that. Uh, secondly, and that'll be for season, ready for this, four. <laughs> <laughs> so we're moving along here. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to say that uh, we're very happy uh, to uh, see the quality that of these presentations and what's coming through uh, in some of the abstracts. I mean, they're really, uh, they're really impressive. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. So Bob is going to first give a, a few ground rules here and then uh, introduce uh, Tom. And uh, I think we're going to be off to the races. And I'll be back at the end to say a few more words. OK. Uh, we've got a, a lot of old friends here, uh, or older friends in my case. Uh, and we got a couple of new folks. So let me just say that when we uh, 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 Tom starts making his presentation, please mute yourself before I mute you. Uh, and if you have a question, please use the chat function. Uh, just run your cursor to the bottom of the uh, uh, screen. There should be a, a chat icon. If there's not a chat icon down there, go to the right before you get to end, click more and the chat will be on that and that'll bring that up. You can type in your question into the chat box. So let us move on. Tonight's speaker, uh, Tom Gilbert, uh, the winner of the uh, Casey Award for baseball's, uh, the best baseball book in 2020. In addition to this award-winning volume, Tom has published a host of baseball books, including a seven volume series, I hope I counted that right, that recounts baseball history from the early 19th century through the 1960s. Uh, he's been lauded as a quote, I, I just found to say, a shrewd historian and a wonderful writer. I don't know which one is more true. <laughs> Tom comes to us from uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, from where he's been a, an integral part of both the 19th century committee symposiums focusing on early baseball in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Tom also uh, has authored essays and uh, articles on Brooklyn history, Hoboken's Elysian Fields, Jim Creighton, and, and a number of uh, other uh, items. Tonight, his talk is baseball's man in Philadelphia, Colonel Tom Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was involved in the founding of the athletics, recruiting Al Reach from Brooklyn. Uh, he was involved with the Black Philadelphia Pythians and Octavius Cato. Uh, Tom will take us through Fitzgerald's early life in New York City uh, through his contributions to the spread of the game to Philadelphia. So Tom, let's bring your slides on up and we'll get going. Okay, hold on. Looking good? Yeah, just go to, yeah, you're good. Okay, um, I'll get started. Um, as it looks like a lot of you know, um, if you go back in baseball history backwards and you go very far backwards to the amateur era and you go before the Civil War, you come to a time when baseball was a New York game. America's largest city played baseball. Boston had the Massachusetts game, Philadelphia played town ball, and there were other bat and ball games in other places. The key difference between the New York game and all the others wasn't the game itself, it was its ambition. Baseball was the only one of these games to decide to become a national sport. But before it could conquer the nation, it had to conquer America's second largest city, Philadelphia. In 1860, the Philadelphia Athletics Town Ball Club 
decided to switch to the New York game of baseball. The Athletics weren't the first or the first domino to fall, but they were arguably the biggest. The Athletics became baseball's most valuable ally in Philadelphia because of their social influence and because they quickly achieved competitive parity with the top New York and Brooklyn clubs. So why did the Athletics change sports? Part of the answer lies in their leadership. The Athletics' most important member was Thomas Fitzgerald, also known as Colonel Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was not a frontline player. Well past his athletic prime in the 1860s, he was the club's chief executive and president from 1861 to 1866, the period when, under his guiding hand, the club grew into a national baseball power. An entrepreneurial, upwardly mobile newspaper man who married into a respectable Philadelphia family, Fitzgerald was the kind of influential figure that baseball needed if the game were to go truly national. The New York baseball establishment warmly welcomed the athletics delegates to the 1860 baseball convention in New York City. Only two years later, they elected Thomas Fitzgerald president of the National Association of Baseball Players, baseball's national governing body. An ex-town ball player living well outside the New York metropolitan area would seem a strange pick for baseball's top job at that early date. But it's doubtful that Fitzgerald was either a baseball novice or a stranger to the New York baseball scene. Colonel Fitzgerald's career with the athletics is full of hints of pre-existing connections to Brooklyn and the New York City baseball clubs. Like so many other early ball players, Fitzgerald served in a militia unit as a young man and very likely belonged to a volunteer fire company. On a trip to Washington in the 1860s, he mentioned to a reporter that he had visited that city years earlier as a member of a New York City militia. In Philadelphia in 1859, although he hold, held no public office in the fire department or anywhere else, he was one of the dignitaries who welcomed the visiting Constitution Engine Company Number 7 of Brooklyn, the pride of that city's growing Irish Catholic community. The most likely explanation is that he knew them. During the early 1860s, uh, Fitzgerald was the go-to intermediary chosen to arrange for New York City and New York baseball clubs to exchange visits with Philadelphia clubs in order to spread and teach the game. The New York Clipper coverage of an 1862 visit to Philadelphia by the Eckfords of Greenpoint gives us a good idea of the warm relations that Fitzgerald had with clubs from Brooklyn, in particular those from the Eastern District, which includes the present Williamsburg and Greenpoint. This is from the uh, Clipper story, quote, on Tuesday morning, the Eckfords and their friends accepted the invitation of Mrs. John Drew to visit the Art Street Theater where seats were reserved for them. On Wednesday, they were taken to the Exhibition of Fine Arts, and the evening went to the Walnut Street Theater, the performances of Miss Charlotte Thompson, especially pleasing the Eckfords. On Thursday, the party went to Girard College. After supper at a hotel, they marched around to the Colonel's residence where he was wait awaiting them and enjoyed delightful piano playing at the hands of Mr. Ryder Fitzgerald, who was Thomas Fitzgerald's son, unquote. Stories like this help us make sense of the odd fact that the athletic club grew out of a classical music organization, Philadelphia's uh, Haydn and Handel music, Musical Society. Many founding and early members of the club were involved in music, singing, and the theater. This included star player DeWitt Clinton Moore, superintendent of Philadelphia's Sunday School, Sunday schools and a church choir director. Hicks Hayhurst and Joseph McGarry were amateur actors who belonged to the Boothian Dramatic Association, which was named after John Wilkes Booth's pro-union older brother Edwin. Fitzgerald himself was an amateur vocalist, a drama critic, and a frequent lecturer on classical music. Like Dr. Joseph Jones of the Brooklyn Excelsiors, Fitzgerald aggressively and shrewdly improved his club by merging with other clubs recruiting established players, and casting a wide net for young prospects. A key part of the athletics crash development program was to play as many games as possible with the superior New York clubs. In midsummer of 1862, the issues, A's issued a challenge to the baseball clubs of Newark, New Jersey, New York City, and Brooklyn. Quote, if not to win the ball, said Moore, then, quote, merely to learn their way of doing the thing, unquote. Thomas Fitzgerald's idea, this was the first ever multi-club inner city tournament. In front of large crowds, a composite team representing Philadelphia surprised no one 
by losing to a team of players from New York, Newark and Brooklyn, but it upset a New York club that had members of the Eagles, Empires, Knickerbockers, and Gotham's, beating them 46 to 23. The Gotham lineup included future Major League manager Harry Wright and William Van Cott, first president of the National Association. This victory won the Philadelphia club some credibility, but no one would have bet on any of them against a top Brooklyn club with a good night's sleep. In June, players from four Brooklyn clubs, Atlantic, Enterprise, Star, and Exercise, made a return trip to Philadelphia and got hustled. Both cities have been asked to divide their players into an A team and a B team. The Brooklynites assumed that they were supposed to put their best players on the A team. The four teams then played a four game round robin and Henry Chadwick explained what happened then. Quote, the Brooklyn players left New York on Monday, June 30th at 2 p.m. and arrived at Philadelphia at 6.30 where they were met by a delegation of the Philadelphia players and duly escorted to the Washington House, a first-class hotel. On their arrival, they were taken into the parlor, where two splendid bowls of claret punch were placed, and as fast as they were emptied by the thirsty travelers, they were replenished. The players of the Brooklyn party should have retired early after their trip in view of the work they had before them, but their friends in the city of Philadelphia would not hear of such a thing, so parties were made up for rambles around the town, and they did not get home until morning, the result being that the majority were unfit to play. Besides making sure that they stayed up all night drinking, the Philadelphians hoodwinked the Brooklynites by putting some of their best players on the B team. So after the Brooklyn A team beat a hungover Brooklyn, Philadelphia A team beat a hungover Brooklyn A team 16 to 10, the Philadelphia B team destroyed the Brooklyn B 22 to 9. In the end, Brooklyn won only one of the four games in the tournament by the score of 18 to 15. As the New York Clipper tells it, there were no hard feelings at the post-tournament dinner which ended a wash in brandy and wartime patriotism, Thomas Fitzgerald raising a glass to quote, the baseball players of Brooklyn, which was received with all the honors. At 12 o'clock, the party broke up, the last song being the Star Spangled Banner, which was given with a will, unquote. By 1865, Colonel Fitzgerald's athletics improved to the point of contending for baseball's national championship. The finishing touch was importing 25-year-old slugging second baseman Al Reach from the Greenpoint Eckfords. The 1865 Athletics went 15 and three, winning two from the unions of Morrisania and losing close games to the champion Brooklyn Atl Atlantics. The 1866 club was even better, going 23 and two. The A's club defeated the unions, the Nationals of Washington, D.C., and the Atlantics. The influential sports weekly, the New York Clipper, praised Colonel Fitzgerald as, quote, the prime mover of everything calculated to advance the interests or extend the popularity of baseball in Philadelphia, unquote. Now, Tom Fitzgerald took the field with the athletics only once that we know of in an intramural game, but he knew too much about baseball and baseball players not to have grown up playing the game. Because he was born in 1819, however, Fitzgerald's playing days, his teens and 20s, came during baseball's dark ages. We know that baseball was played in the 1830s, but we have almost no names, box scores, or game accounts. Of course, in order to have played baseball at that time, Thomas Fitzgerald would have had to live in or around New York City. Fitzgerald was, in fact, a New Yorker born and raised. You may have met people who, when you ask them about their childhood, recite the, recite the same impersonal facts, things like the exact time and date or place of their birth and not much more. And usually there's a reason for this. Sometimes it is a trauma or unhappiness that they want to forget. Sometimes they were orphaned or adopted, and that's all they know. When Thomas Fitzgerald was asked about his childhood, he said that he was born in New York City on December 22nd, 1819, at the future site of the Harper Brothers Publishing House. He sometimes added that he was working as a printer at a young age when other children were in school. Other than suggesting that he was related to Irish nobility, the Fitzgerald family, that was the whole story as he told it. Now, family was unusually important to Thomas Fitzgerald when he was an adult. In middle age, he made annual summer visits to Ireland where he hobnobbed with aristocratic Fitzgeralds like the Duke of Leinster and the Marquis of Kildare, whom he allowed people to believe were his relatives. He was very close to his daughter and five sons who helped him run his newspaper, the Philadelphia City Item. All of Fitzgerald's sons played for Philadelphia baseball clubs, including the Minervas, the City Item's own team, and, I think significantly, a junior club named after the Eckfords of Greenpoint. 
Yet Thomas Fitzgerald never, as far as we know, uttered one single word about his mother, father, or siblings, not even their names. Searching for Thomas Fitzgerald's origins, I couldn't locate a birth or baptismal record that matches his account of his birth, which given the state of records from that time isn't surprising, but the specificity of his statement that he was born on the site of the Harper Brothers printing house is a clue, one that leads to a particular part of Lower Manhattan. In the 19th century, the Harper Brothers printing house was located on Franklin Square in the Fourth Ward, a rough neighborhood uh, that in the 18 teens and 20s was home to printers, sailors, poor Irish immigrants, African Americans, and New York's earliest Chinese community. Uh, a lot of it has been obliterated by the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. No one was living at that exact address in 1819, but just to the east of the Harper Brothers buildings was a street called Hague Street, which intersected Franklin Square. Hague Street, located near the present intersection of Pearl and Dover Streets, isn't there anymore. It's an off-ramp for the Brooklyn Bridge. Around 1820, a publisher named William Collier had a printing plant at number five Hague Street, and Collier was a cousin and business partner of the Harper Brothers. Longworth's New York City directories for the early decades of the 19th century contained very few people named Fitzgerald. Many of them lived in the fourth ward of Manhattan, particularly in several households on Tiny Hague Street and nearby Oak Street. Some or all of these families were probably related. The 1827 directory lists only 11 people named Fitzgerald, one Fitzgerald, widow of Edmund Grocer. This woman lived at 8 Hague Street. Born in Ireland in 1774, her name was Ellen Fitzgerald. Her husband, Edmund, also born in Ireland, died in 1823, leaving no money or possessions. Censuses from 1840, an earlier list only heads of household by name, and for everyone else gives numbers broken down by sex, age, race, and for African Americans, if they were free or slaves. Comparing all the Fitzgerald families in New York City listed in the 1820 and 1830 censuses, there are only two that fit what Thomas Fitzgerald said about his early background and who had a male child born around 1819 that could have been him. Uh, one is the family of Edmund and Ellen Fitzgerald. They lived within literal spitting distance of a printing house owned by a member of the Harper family. They emigrated to the US in 1799 which if you know your Irish history suggests that they were refugees from the Irish rebellion of 1798. Perhaps Thomas Fitzgerald inherited his parents' Irish republicanism. As an adult, he was active in national organizations that supported both Irish independence and opposed American slavery. New York City in 1823 was a very rough place for a widowed, unskilled immigrant. Some in Ellen Fitzgerald's position abandoned their children and, or resorted to prostitution. She had three children, Edmund Jr., who was 15 or 16, Ellen, who was seven or eight, and a younger son, likely three-year-old Thomas. We do not know how old Miss, how Mrs. Fitzgerald survived the next six or seven years after her husband died. According to a city directory in 1827, her son Edmund was working as a grocer as his father had, but that, it would have been difficult for an unskilled laborer in his teens to support a family. The likelihood is that this family was desperately poor. There's one other candidate for Thomas Fitzgerald's parents, Garrett Fitzgerald and his wife, Catherine, who lived on Oak Street in the Fourth Ward, possibly relatives of Edmund and Ellen, but their story is even bleaker. Catherine died in childbirth in 1826, and Garrett Fitzgerald died in the cholera epidemic of 1832, when Thomas Fitzgerald would have been around 12. Uh, a couple named Garrett and Catherine Fitzgerald actually baptized a son named Thomas at St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church in New York City in late December of 1818 which is tantalizing because it is almost one year earlier to the day than the date of birth given by the adult Thomas Fitzgerald, which makes you wonder if Fitzgerald could have actually been born on December 22nd, 1818, instead of 1819. But I think it's hard to imagine how throughout his life, Thomas Fitzgerald could have consistently thought that he was one year younger than his actual age. Another is that two different, one, one possibility is that two different Thomas Fitzgeralds who were born a year apart. Given names run in families, some of, or all of the fourth word Fitzgerald families were related, and Thomas is certainly not an uncommon name. But whichever of these families Thomas Fitzgerald was born into, his childhood was likely something out of a Charles Dickens novel. 
Widowers in 1826 did not normally raise children. And if he was the son of Garrett Fitzgerald, he would have been sent to relatives, an orphanage, or into an apprenticeship, or more than one of these things. According to Thomas Fitzgerald himself, he worked as a printer at a very young age. If he was the son of Ellen, she might have decided to apprentice her younger son to a printer as soon as he was old enough in order to have one fewer mouth to feed. Irish immigrant families of that time were known to sacrifice one child's education for the sake of the others. Now, apprenticeships at that time normally lasted four to seven years and were legally binding, the apprentices working for free or very little. We don't know how young Thomas Fitzgerald was when he was in effect given into temporary slavery. 11 or younger was unusual, but not unheard of. Apprentices often lived at their employer's home or shop, and many were exploited or enhanced by older apprentices. We can only wonder what kind of misery lies behind Thomas Fitzgerald's statement that he was, quote, working at an age when other children were in school, unquote. The printer that Thomas Fitzgerald went to work for was the family's neighbor on Hague Street, Harper Brothers' cousin, William Collier. Collier worked in Manhattan, but lived across the East River in Williamsburg, where in 1840, he hired a political radical who recently arrived from England named Thomas Ainge de Vere, who had escaped prosecution in the United Kingdom. Collier hired him to edit a Democratic Party newspaper that he was launching in Brooklyn. In his autobiography, de Vere says that Collier paid him through an associate named Fitzgerald. De Vere's son, Thomas de Vere Jr., you may have heard of, he was born in Brooklyn in 1844, was an outstanding athlete who played baseball for the Marians, Eckfords, and Mutuals, and was caught up in baseball's first game-fixing scandal in 1865, initially banned from the sport, but he was reinstated one year later thanks to lobbying by Henry Chadwick, a fellow Brooklynite whose father had also left England for political reasons. The De Veres and Chadwicks probably knew each other. It would be surprising if they didn't. But there is no question that Tom DeVere, the ballplayer, knew Thomas Fitzgerald. In 1896, after DeVere Jr. died at 51, a reporter visited his bare Greenpoint apartment and reflected on his faded glory. Of all the many prizes he received, he wrote, none remained in his possession at the time of his death except a book of poems bestowed on him by Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald, president of the Athletic Club of Philadelphia, unquote. It is at the very least possible that Thomas Fitzgerald knew DeVere and other baseball figures in Brooklyn as a boy or young man before he moved to Philadelphia in his 20s. All we know about Thomas Fitzgerald's life immediately before his arrival in Philadelphia in the mid-1840s are the names of the newspapers he worked for as he moved from printer to journalist to editor. Besides the New York Commercial Advertiser, the list includes the New Brunswick, New Jersey Fredonian, the Philadelphia Bulletin, and the Tallahassee Floridian. He had no known family in any of these places. In his teens and early 20s, Thomas Fitzgerald seems to have been, like Walt Whitman, a rootless printer and journalist, single and living alone. Did he resent being apprenticed as a boy? Did he simply want to put an unhappy childhood behind him? Whatever the reason, Fitzgerald moved to Philadelphia and decided to become someone else. Thomas Fitzgerald founded the City Item newspaper as a weekly in 1847. He had three partners, friends from his days as a printer and journalist in New York. One of them was George G. Foster, who invented the, quote, City Items column for the New York Tribune. The original City Items was a potpourri of gossip, comments on musical concerts, politics, crimes, and city life delivered with Foster's urbane wit. His special contribution, wrote historian George Rogers Taylor, quote, arises from his focusing attention so largely on common people, not only beggars and prostitutes, but on the great numbers of working men and women, the dandies and the bill posters, the Bowery boys and gals, the women arriving by carriage to shop at Stewart's, the seamstresses working in garrets. Foster describes in realistic detail those whom Walt Whitman sketched poetically in the Song of Myself, unquote. So Fitzgerald's idea, and along with his partners, was to turn this journalistic innovation from New York City into a business plan for an entire newspaper in Philadelphia, and it worked. In the 1850s, Fitzgerald bought out Foster and the others and eventually made the item a daily. He married Sarah Levering, writer of Germantown in 1844. We don't know what his wife and family knew about his early life, 
But the face that Thomas Fitzgerald showed to Philadelphia and the world after becoming a successful publisher was largely a work of fiction. Fitzgerald gave talks on Mozart and wrote about opera, classical music, and the theater. He published articles and poetry for Philadelphia-based national magazines and composed songs. An eloquent public speaker, he was active in local democratic politics, which was the only kind there was in Philadelphia, and advocated successfully for musical education in public schools. He had several plays produced, his biggest success being the 1868 Light at Last, which starred Louisa Lane Drew, the great-great-grandmother of actress Drew Barrymore. Sometime in the middle or late 60s, Fitzgerald joined the Republican Party. He was a fervent abolitionist and campaigned across Pennsylvania as a war Democrat for Abraham Lincoln. You can see in this poster, he's the, on the list of speakers, um, Colonel Fitzgerald, war Democrat. He became friends with Lincoln. Another part of Fitzgerald's self-reinvention was changing religions. In 1870, Fitzgerald and three of his sons were confirmed in the Congregational Church, and the records note that Fitzgerald had been baptized Roman Catholic. Finally, in the 1880s and 90s, he began making regular trips to Europe, where he visited Maynooth Castle and Cart Carton House in Ireland, owned by the Duke of Leinster, whose surname was Fitzgerald. American newspapers carried stories about Thomas Fitzgerald's visits to his illustrious relatives in the old country. But in 1888, the Irish American Weekly of New York pointed out that the Catholic-born Thomas Fitzgerald of Philadelphia could not have been related to the Duke of Leinster or anyone in his family. The New York Herald must have, been, must have been betrayed into a curious jumble when it referred to Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald of Philadelphia as a possible presidential candidate in the following terms. Quote, Fitzgerald has been put in nomination as the lineal descendant of the dynasty of Irish kings and the oldest American representative of the Duke of Leinster's family. So we're not gonna detour into the thickets of an aristocratic succession controversy, but Thomas Fitzgerald was probably no more closely related to the Duke of Leinster than F. Scott, Ella, or any of the thousands of people in the world named Fitzgerald. Significantly, Fitzgerald never explicitly claimed to be related to these aristocrats. Perhaps the Duke of Leinster socialized with Thomas Fitzgerald because he enjoyed the company of a gregarious American millionaire. So <clears throat> what, what explains Thomas Fitzgerald's transformation from an unschooled child of the slums into erudite man of the world? His wife had a good education and may have educated him about classical music, but a more plausible answer is that Fitzgerald educated himself. In the early 19th century, a well-traveled path led from apprentice to printer to journalist to writer. Printers and typographers unions offered night classes, libraries, and other forms of education. Many 19th century American literary men rose from equally humble origins. These included members of Tom Fitzgerald's New York City social and professional milieu, people like Rufus Griswold, Edgar Allan Poe's friend and literary executor, George Wilkes, and George G. Foster. Rumored to have been illegitimate and raised in a brothel, George Wilkes did not have an education that we know of, but he went on to publish scholarly works on the plays of Shakespeare, as well as editing the National Sports Weekly, Wilkes Spirit of the Times. The child of a Vermont shoemaker, Griswold left home at 15 and educated himself while working as a printer in New York. He became a published poet and literary critic. Thomas Fitzgerald's writing style tells us a lot about where he came from. It is well seasoned with Bowery Boy self-assertion and joy in puncturing smugness and hypocrisy of the kind that characterizes Mike Walsh or George Wilkes of the Subterranean or National Police Gazette days. For a time, Fitzgerald City Item used the advertising slogan, quote, independent in everything, unquote. An allusion to the subterranean's famous motto, independent in everything, neutral in nothing. Meanwhile, back in New York City's fourth ward, Edmund Fitzgerald, our number one candidate for Thomas Fitzgerald's older brother, was moving up the Tammany Hall food chain. In 1841, he appears on a Democratic committee with publisher William Collier. In 1845, he's a poll inspector and member of a ward committee. Later that year, he's police captain of the fourth ward. He and his mother, Ellen, move into an apartment above the police station at 9 Oak Street, less than half a block from Haig Street. In 1847, Edmund Fitzgerald ran for New York City alderman, a lucrative position, and won. The family fortunes for the Fitzgeralds were looking up, but in 1852, the single and unmarried Edmund died 
leaving his entire estate to his mother, Ellen, who died five years later at the age of 83. Uh, there are two, more, two last interesting details about Ellen Fitzgerald. She's buried in a crypt under Old St. Pat's Cathedral on New York City's Mulberry Street. I snuck down there and looked at it. The inscription on the vault's marble door is kind of funny. It says, Ellen Fitzgerald's Family Vault, 1852. To me, conveying the vanity of a simple woman who, after a long and hard life, managed to afford an expensive exit. And I ran across an interview with uh, the guy who was the curator or the, the um, guard of the crypt in the 60s and 70s. And he said that um, in 1960, John F. Kennedy showed up, wanted to see the crypt, and said that he was related to Ellen Fitzgerald. I wasn't able to prove it, but John Kennedy thought he was related to this woman, which makes him related to Tom Fitzgerald. It's not hard to imagine why Thomas Fitzgerald never discussed his early life. He lost one or both of his parents as a boy. He was sent to work instead of school. Even if he had no hard feelings toward the rest of his family, the sophisticated, successful Protestant and abolitionist pillar of Philadelphia society friend of aristocrats and political ally of presidents that he became, did not need any connection to the Fitzgeralds of the Fourth Ward. Thomas Fitzgerald, the Philadelphian, was a shrewd baseball man who was determined to build the athletics into a top club, but there were things he was not willing to do to win baseball games. Several times during the 1860s, a dispute within the athletics caused Fitzgerald to put his foot down and resign as club president. Each time the dispute was settled and the club asked him back. We don't know what all these disputes were about, but a good guess would be club actions that in Fitzgerald's mind violated baseball's amateur ethic. The 1866 dispute was so bitter that Fitzgerald's resignation was accepted. It is clear from the public relations war that broke out afterward that Fitzgerald had resigned because the athletics in Fitzgerald's views were paying, view were paying players illegally and lowering their admission standards in order to improve the club on the field. Because other clubs in baseball were facing the same issues and conflicts, the dispute between Fitzgerald and the athletics went national. In early March of 1866, the athletics had unanimously reelected Tom Fitzgerald as president for the fifth time. They were at a high point with the largest membership of any baseball club in the country, over 400 members paying $20 a year dues, a fat bank account, and some of the nation's best players. The athletics were about to come within one unplayed game of being the first club outside baseball's holy land, the New York City area, to win a national baseball championship. But in May, the newspapers reported the shocking news that Fitzgerald had resigned to take over the equity club, which, by the way, immediately began to improve. Fitzgerald's city item then ran a series of stories accusing DeWitt Clinton Moore and Hicks Hayhurst of the athletics of using, quote, hired men. Mercenaries paid $20 a week in violation of National Association rules on amateurism. The item gave Fitzgerald's old friend, successor as club president and choir director, DeWitt Clinton Moore, the derisive nickname of the Psalm Singing Hypocrite, PSH for short, and that had to hurt. The paper asked rhetorically, now in the case of a close game, a game between say the Atlantics, Excelsiors, Mutuals, or Eurekas, would you trust some of these hired men did they receive liberal offers from the outside betting fraternity? Don't you think an offer of $500 would have its effect? Can you trust a fellow who sells his services to the highest bidder? Unquote. In July, the city item reprinted the following want ad from the New York Clipper. Wanted a first-class baseball pitcher for a series of match games to come off this season by addressing to A. Schneider, PO Box 141, Sunbury, Pennsylvania, you can learn particulars. Unquote. To which at Fitzgerald added, we call the attention of pitchers who desire to hire themselves out by the day, week, month, or year to the above ad. How much can Snyder give? Can he pay $20 a week? What security does he offer? Has any poor relations? Will cold vittles be thrown in? Unquote. Fitzgerald's jihad against professionalism on his own club made enemies. Some of them retaliated by falsely accusing him of offering cash to entice players to join his new club, the Equity. Fitzgerald was publicly expelled from the athletics, the club he had co-founded. But some in baseball took his side. When Fitzgerald ran a comic caricature of one of the hired men, and that's the slide, it looks a little bit like Lip Pike to me, and said of, said of them, 
quote, they generally come from New York and with only one or two exceptions, hint, 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 are about the hardest set we ever saw, unquote. He received a fan letter from Brooklyn. Dear sir, it read, will you have the kindness to mail me three or four copies of your newspaper containing the portrait of the hired man? I called at the Excelsior Club Rooms the other evening and was much amused, as were many others. By hearing Dr. Jones read several extracts from last week's paper, hoping our national game may continue to prosper as it has done and that hired men may soon become extinct, unquote. Fitzgerald's newspaper specified that the Athletics had four players who were paid directly or, quote, constructively. He didn't name names, but we have enough information, including publishing, uh, he, well, he offered enough information, including publishing a list of starting athletic players who weren't paid, that we can identify the filthy four with some confidence. Three of them were Patsy Dockney of Hoboken, Littman Pike from Brooklyn, and Al Reach from Brooklyn. The other one is almost certainly pitcher Dick McBride, a native Philadelphia. <clears throat> Dockney and Pike certainly are a good fit for the category of hardest set we ever saw. Both were more at home in a saloon than at a classical concert. As Fitzgerald wrote, quote, the officers of the athletic club have done much to bring the game into contempt by employing men to play in their nine who have been repeatedly arrested and confined in the station house on charges of drunkenness and rioting. There was a time when a player would have been expelled from his club for drunkenness and rioting, but that today seems to have passed, unquote. Dogney's brilliant career as a catcher was derailed by a chest wound sustained in a brawl at a Cincinnati bordello. He later sold fish in New York City's Washington market and served several prison terms. A speedy left-handed power hitter who once won a foot race around the bases against the thoroughbred horse, Pike had a long career in amateur and pro baseball. Uh, in 1889, Lippmann was put on a temporary blacklist by the National League for being, quote, dissipated, i.e. drunk, and insubordinate, i.e. he annoyed a club owner. If there was an ulterior reason, we don't know it. Al Reach was no lowlife, but rumor had it that in 1866, the athletics paid him by giving him a house. Both Dockney and Pike left Philadelphia soon after the city item stories in late 66. It is often claimed that in 1865, the ostensibly amateur Al Reach was paid $25 a week by Fitzgerald and the A's to leave the actors and play for Philadelphia, and that this makes Thomas Fitzgerald a hypocrite. Today, Reach and James Creighton are at the top of modern lists of amateur era secret professionals, players who were paid under the table. But I believe that this misreads the times and baseball world in which Reach and Creighton live. Until the 1869 season, the letter of the National Association rules prohibited clubs from paying or compensating players in any form. But as applied, the prohibition was much more subtle. No one in baseball in 1865 considered Reach's relationship with the athletics to be improper. And the same is true of Creighton before 1862. The fact that we are confused today about the distinction between amateurism and professionalism in 1860s baseball, or that the National Organization, uh, National Association did not want to police it, does not mean that no distinction existed. Two things are clear. Some forms of player compensation were generally regarded as honest, and some weren't. And this depended on the player's relationship to the club. Virtually all the outrage about so-called professionalism in the amateur era was about players jumping or revolving from one club to another. The central issue in these cases was loyalty, not payment per se. The same Excelsiors who applauded Tom Fitzgerald's campaign against hired men helped Creighton and his father buy a house and got them no-show patronage jobs in the New York City Customs House. They also secured star second baseman George Flanley, who came from a poor family, a job in the Brooklyn Police Department. These were not considered violations of the amateur ethic, but rather mutual assistance by club members. Even the moralistic Henry Chadwick himself drew a distinction between hired men and, quote, those whose loss of time and necessary expenses are very properly paid, unquote. All clubs, he wrote, who have first-class players in their nines, this is Chadwick, whose positions in life are not surrounded with pecuniary advantage, who are not, in fact, well off in the world, of course take play care that their players are not sufferers from sacrificing their time to sustain the playing reputation of the club of which they are prominent players. But this style of thing is very different from, quote, hiring men or paying them so much a week for their services as professional cricketers are paid, unquote. The Excelsiors may have aided James Creighton financially, 
so that he could play, but the Excelsiors didn't lie about it, and they didn't need to. Interestingly, they did finesse the issue of when Creighton came to Brooklyn, saying that he moved there as a young boy instead of in 1858 when he was 17, which you often read in uh, baseball references today. The reason they did so was to suggest that Creighton legitimately belonged to the community that had produced the rest of his team. In any case, Creighton remained with the Excelsiors for the rest of his life, and so did Al Reach, who lived to 87. In 1865, Reach was playing for the athletics, but still living in his hometown of Brooklyn, which is actually about five blocks his house from where I'm sitting, while he considered moving his entire family, father, brothers, and fiance to Philadelphia. A likely explanation for the $25 a week figure was that it was reimbursement for expenses, two or three round trips, a week during the baseball season by train between New York and Philadelphia, which is about what that would come to. Soon after Reach brought his family to Philadelphia in 1866, Thomas Fitzgerald helped him and his brother establish a cigar shop, but this was already Reach's brother's business. The important fact is that in 1865, no one saw Reach as in any sense a mercenary. He came to Philadelphia with his entire family intending to put down roots, and he did. It is revealing that in 1866, Fitzgerald's baseball enemies didn't attack him for having paid Al Reach. Instead, they used made-up charges that he was trying to pay members of other clubs to jump to his equity club. Reach, of course, played the rest of his career in Philadelphia, where he started the sporting goods business that made him rich, and where he founded the National League Phillies in 1883, co-founded. Dave McBride also played his, virtually his entire amateur and professional career in Philadelphia, his hometown. There are two possible reasons why these non-hired men might have been paid by the club in 1866. One is fairness, because equal or lesser players brought from outside were getting paid. The other is that in the late 1860s, baseball clubs were ra raiding each other's rosters in a kind of feeding frenzy, and the A's may have paid Reach and McBride so they wouldn't be tempted to leave. But one look at their careers will tell you that Patsy Dockney and Lippman Pike were out-and-out -out mercenaries. Dockney played for the Gothams in 1864 and 5, the Atlantics in 66, the Eurekas of New York in 1867, both the Buckeyes and New York Mutuals in 1868. Lippman Pike came up through Brooklyn Junior Clubs under the control of the Atlantics, where he was playing when he jumped to the A's for the 66 season, and after that played for New York, Baltimore, Hartford, St. Louis, Cincinnati, and Providence. The controversy over Fitzgerald and the four hired men blew over without anybody being disciplined or suspended. It was just another bit of unpleasantness in a chaotic and quarrelsome baseball season. In 1866, baseball was caught between two eras. Home clubs still treated visiting clubs to banquets and outings as if they were personal guests. But when it came to money issues like scheduling championship games or divvying up gate receipts, they played hardball. In 1866, a war-weary America embraced baseball as entertainment and the money poured in. Not all of the men who ran the top clubs, however, were up to this, handling this change. As with other amateur era traditions, baseball was outgrowing the traditional way of determining national champions, a three-game series negotiated by the interested parties themselves. A scheduling disagreement marred the championship series between the Athletics and Atlantics in 1865. There were leftover hard feelings, but the A's were looking forward to another shot at the Atlantics in the three-game series they hoped to play in 1866, and they would be disappointed again. However, reluctantly, every 19th century American institution ended up having to take a stand on race. Amateur baseball's time came in the fall of 1867 when an African-American club, the Pythians of Philadelphia, applied for permission to the National Association via the Pennsylvania State Association, which touched off another bitter baseball controversy with national repercussions that Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald dumped into with both feet. The difference this time was that the hired men controversy had cost Fitzgerald his position as president of the Athletics, the most important baseball club in Philadelphia. In 1867, when baseball urgently needed an effective advocate for racial inclusion, Fitzgerald's influence in the baseball world was at a low point. He had one weapon, the bully pulpit of his popular newspaper, The City Item. To understand the story of the Pythians, a little background is necessary. It's difficult to say which American city had the worst race relations in the mid 19th century, but Philadelphia was certainly a contender. The city had bloody race riots, that is white people rioting, in 1834, 1838, and 1842. 
Instead of segregating its streetcars, until 1867, Philadelphia banned African Americans entirely. No exceptions made for wives or children who late in the war were visiting hospitalized Civil War veterans. Frederick Douglass, whose son Fred Douglass Jr. played baseball for the African American Alert Club of Washington, D.C., referred to Philadelphia as the, quote, up south. Thanks to racially progressive Quakers and the Underground Railroad, however, the city also had a large African American community anchored by institutions like the Institute for Colored Youth. A school for higher education founded in 1837 by a Quaker, originally located at 7th and Lombard, the Institute ultimately moved in 1902 to Delaware County, where it is still in business today under the name Cheney University. Like other Philadelphians, African Americans in the city had long played cricket and town ball. In 1866, a group of African American business and professional men founded a baseball club and they named it the Pythians. Their on field leader was Octavius Caddo, a teacher at the Institute of, for Colored Youth and a civil rights activist who led campaigns for African Americans to fight in the Civil War and to use the Philadelphia streetcars. 1870 and 1871 were very troubled years racially in America. In February of 1870, Congress passed the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, guaranteeing American men voting rights regardless of, quote, race, color, or previous servitude, unquote. In Philadelphia, the ruling Democratic Party lashed back with a campaign of intimidation and threats to try to stop African Americans, who, of course, supported Republicans from voting. On election day of 1871, African Americans in public places around the city were harassed, assaulted, and fired upon by roving white gangs deployed by city politicians. Octavius Caddo was on his way home near South Street and 9th Street when a Moya Mensing volunteer fireman and part time Democratic Party goon named Frank Kelly walked up and shot him, shot him dead. Caddo was given full military honors and Philadelphia's largest funeral since the ceremonies for Abraham Lincoln. Kelly was arrested six years later, but acquitted of murder, which surprised no one in Philadelphia. In 2017, a statue of Octavius Caddo with his arms out and palms turned up in a questioning gesture, as eyewitnesses said they were when he died, was set up outside Philadelphia City Hall. In 1867, in their first season, Octavius Caddo's Pythians had defeated local rivals and established themselves as the consensus African American champions of Philadelphia. They went to Washington where they beat the alerts and mutuals. The Pythian's success inspired civic pride in some quarters of the mainstream press. When the Philadelphia Excelsiors defeated an African-American club from New York, the Philadelphia Sunday Mercury wrote, quote, the New York papers apply the title of champions to the Excelsiors, that's not, of course, the white Excelsiors, and then abuse and ridicule them after the fashion of New York. The Pythians, also of the city, are the recognized champions among colored organizations, and should they ever decide to visit New York, an opportunity will be afforded Philadelphia defamers to see a well-behaved set of gentlemen, unquote. Amateur baseball was always looking for a few well-behaved gentlemen. So far, all of them have been white, but the National Association had no actual rule banning African-Americans. None of the African-American clubs in New York City or Brooklyn had ever tried to join. In October of 67, the clubs of the Pennsylvania State uh, a baseball association, member organization of the NABBP, were holding their annual convention in Harrisburg. The president of the association happened to be the athletics delegate Hicks Hayhurst, a Quaker and racial liberal who had umpired Pythian games. The Pythians were a credible African-American club, equal or superior to many white clubs in education and social class, and they decided the time was right to test amateur baseball's principles. They sent Raymond Burr, son of abolitionist newspaper editor John Pierre Burr, rumored to be the unacknowledged child of Vice President Aaron Burr, to Harrisburg to apply for admission to the NABBP. Burr was treated politely, but the nominations committee postponed consideration of the Pythians until the following day. That night, Hayhurst convinced Burr to withdraw the Pythians' application by telling him they had no chance of winning in a pub public vote. The nightmare of white discomfort was averted, but men of influence in baseball decided to make sure that this would not come up again. At the national convention held soon after in Philadelphia, a committee, including respected Knickerbocker James White Davis, authored a resolution that barred African Americans. When it passed, baseball's first cover line had been drawn. A Wall Street stockbroker, Davis had two nicknames. The Fiend, because of his intensity, 
and too late because he tended to show up in the middle of the first inning. Like other Knickerbockers, Davis belonged to volunteer fire company Oceana Hose No. 36. Elected several times to the presidency of the Knickerbocker Club, he served on the three-man committee that put on the 1858 Fashion Course Series between New York City and Brooklyn. And he was a good enough outfielder at age 32 to play center field in the second game of the series. Confirming the eternal truth of modern hitting coach Rick Down's mantra, if you can't dance, you can't hit. Davis won the dance contest at the New York Stock Exchange Christmas party in 1880, the year he retired from baseball at the age of 54. We don't really know enough to assess Davis, Davis's exact degree of responsibility for organized baseball's first formal action, act of racial exclusion, but it probably lies somewhere between main actor and guilty bystander. Historians would later call baseball's car line an informal gentleman's agreement, but those words aren't really apt. In 1867, the National Association put it down in black and white. The delegates passed a rule barring from membership any club, quote, composed of persons of color or any portion of them, unquote. This grammatically clumsy resolution was written by the nominating committee, which had three members. William Sin, owner of Philadelphia's New Chestnut Street Theater. Sin had been arrested in 1861 while trying to join the Confederate Army, and for all I know was a racist, but Sin had no power or influence in baseball. The other two members did. Prominent baseball veterans, Dr. William H. Bell, a former member of the Rules Committee and co-founder of the Eckfords and several other clubs, and James White Davis, one of the two Knickerbocker delegates to the convention. The Knickerbockers were orthodox amateurs who dissented from the creeping professionalism of the late amateur era. They refused to accept a penny from any ticket sales to their games, which makes it ironic that some of them later asserted parental rights over professional baseball. In 1893, James White Davis asked one of the owners of the New York Giants to launch a fund to pay for his grave monument, which he wanted to be inscribed as follows, quote, wrapped in the original flag of the Knickerbockers Baseball Club of New York, here lies James White Davis, a member for 30 years. He was not, quote, too late reaching the home plate, unquote. Davis thought that this should be paid for by the National League players who, in his mind, owed their livelihood to him and the Knickerbockers. Neither the fund nor the monument materialized, and it is doubtful that anyone then playing Major League Baseball had ever heard of it. In 1868, the Pythians returned to playing other African-American clubs, but they still had friends in white baseball, Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald being a prominent one. But after his 1866 breakup with the athletics, there wasn't much he could do besides complain in the pages of his paper. He criticized the state convention for rejecting the Pythians in 1867. In 1869, seeing that the Pythians had improved to the point where they could hold their own against a mid-level white club, Fitzgerald started to beat the drum for a kind of baseball integration. His tactic was to encourage, even embarrass, prominent white clubs into playing the Pythians. And this is interesting to me because Thomas Fitzgerald's racial attitudes seemed shockingly out of their time. But the fact that they were published in a newspaper with a large circulation suggests that there were probably more people with views like his than we might think. Fitzgerald despi despised blackface entertainment, calling it low and vulgar. He mocked fellow athletics co-founder DeWitt Clinton Moore for telling racist jokes with a lame African-American accent. In May of 69, Fitzgerald trolled racists with a news item that read, quote, there are two baseball clubs in Wilmington, North Carolina composed of colored men, but they allow white men to play with them occasionally, unquote. In July, he wrote, the Pythians, have beaten all the colored clubs and would like to play a match with some of their white brethren. What do you say, athletics, Olympics, Keystones, Intrepids, et cetera? This was followed by, why is it that the athletics will not play a colored baseball club, the Pythians? Are they afraid of them? As I hear, the Pythians are very strong. I think it is quite possible that the apprehension of being beaten is the real cause, unquote. Calling the white clubs out got results, although not from the athletics. In September of 69, Philadelphia's venerable Olympics took the field against the Pythians with Tom Fitzgerald umpiring. The Olympics won what was arguably the first baseball game played between a National Association club and an African-American club, 44 to 23. After which the door opened a crack. Isolated interracial games were played in 1869 in Boston and in Washington. The Pythians found a few willing white opponents, including the City Item employees team with three of Fitzgerald's sons in the lineup. The Pythians won that game 27 to 17. 
On this note of hope, the story of the Pythians ends. After Cato's assassination, the Pythians announced that, quote, in the death of Octavius V. Cato, our, our organization has lost its most active and valued member, unquote. They promised that they would carry on his struggle for truth, justice, and equality, but they wouldn't be doing it through baseball. The amateur era ended on St. Patrick's Day of 1871 when the National Association, America's first professional baseball league, was formed. The NA was all white and hired men were welcome. The same was true for the National League, which replaced the National Association in 1876. The top amateur era clubs, including those in Philadelphia, faced a challenging transition to professionalism. The A's handled it better than most. They joined the NA, won its first pennant, and remained competitive. They played one season in the new National League in 1876. Like most of the other great men of the amateur era, Colonel Fitzgerald was not involved with baseball at the top competitive levels in the professional era, but he continued to sponsor youth and amateur baseball and remain, remained an important figure in journalism, politics, and Philadelphia society. The city item prospered and made him rich. In 1888, he was spoken of as a possible presidential candidate. In 1890, he retired, turning over his newspaper to his sons, he died the following year while on his annual trip to Europe. He is buried in West Philadelphia's now vandalized and overgrown Mount Moriah Cemetery, a place as impoverished and neglected as the inner city neighborhood he was born in. In life, Fitzgerald was a happy warrior. In the 1860s, he waged two high stakes public battles, one against racism, the other for the amateur ideal and the young sport of baseball's credibility with the Protestant bourgeoisie. In both places, cases, he fought and lost the good fight, but Fitzgerald won the most important fight of his life to establish baseball in Philadelphia, co-founding and helping build the athletics, Philadelphia's first nationally competitive baseball club. He deserves a share of the credit for the victory of the baseball movement itself. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Let's see, are you seeing me now? Yes, we are. We're, you're doing fine. Uh, we had a couple of comments in the, the chat. Uh, Eric Micklick noted that uh, in addition to Reach, uh, Fitzgerald stole Wes Fistler from the Eckfords. And, uh, uh, apparently, he, he took his eyes off the, the Hockey League and what the Rangers chasing after the Islanders. Uh, he also <laughs> noted that the, uh, the the athletic were essentially a traveling club under Fitzgerald. And how were the players taken care of? Were the the club pay for hotels, meals, transportation, all those sorts of things? Yeah, and uh, they were paid out of uh, gate money, and and the club uh, was supported by dues, membership dues. And you know, at a certain point, they're they're charging admission. Uh, he also notes that, that that Reach played for the Eckfords and the uh, Athletics in 1864, kind of going against the 30-day rule that went through, where he played for uh, Philadelphia in the end of June and uh, before the end of July. He also, uh, excuse me, he uh, he was with the uh, with Phil with the Eckford Club against Newark. Was that yeah. just kind of ignored? Well. Um... You know, in my view, if you look at all the disputes about professionalism, and it's 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 kind of educational to look at it and focus on the idea of club control of talent. That kind of explains everything people did. You know, because if you look at it in terms of who got paid or compensated, it's very confusing. What they really cared about, which of course teams still care about, is controlling talent. Yeah, I just yeah. want to say, Bob, very quickly that my point was that Fitzgerald wanted to be holier than now, but he was doing all this stuff, paying players, having players play before the 30 day period, but he, he didn't like when other teams were doing the same thing. Yeah, I think okay. it's easy to call someone a hypocrite, but you know, and I've struggled with these issues because some things that appear to be obvious violations of baseball rules are clearly tolerated. And like I said in my piece, people are making other kinds of distinctions, right? Like Chadwick. But I think um, it's worth remembering that if you had to explain to someone from Mars right now what our line was between amateurism and professionalism, it'd be pretty difficult to explain. I mean, in my lifetime, we've gone from actual amateurs playing in the Olympics to, you know, career professionals playing, and it's hard to really explain where the line is always. So I think Fitzgerald sincerely believed that he knew where the line was. It turned out that, you know, the baseball establishment didn't agree with him. And, uh, 
the fact that it was subtle and changeable meant that people could disagree about it. Uh, Stu Thornley had a, a, a question that was, that was commented on by, by another uh, attendee. Uh, Fitzgerald was described as a war Democrat, and he was wondering what that meant. And Mark Robinson responded that the uh, war Democrats in American politics in the 1860s were, were Democrats who supported the Union and rejected the, essentially the, the Copper Edge. We were the Northern anti-war uh, uh, right, Democrats. So and, and he said further, the Copperheads or Peace Democrats were the opposing the war, whereas the war Democrats were supported Lincoln. Right. So um, it was, while still the Democrat Fitzgerald's out there campaigning for Lincoln, and he wasn't the only one. Ultimately, he switched sides. But there were plenty of Democrats that opposed, you know, were abolitionists and opposed slavery, and there were plenty that supported it and plenty in the middle. Uh, Bob Folk just noted from the talk of uh, supporting the players while they were traveling on the road that a majority of the players were amateurs and had day jobs, but that still didn't cover their expenses, but you were talking about dues and, and uh, ownership. Uh, well, uh, you know, the, I think that. The, the answer to that probably depends on almost what month of what year you're talking about, because things were changing. And, you know, you read uh, John Chapman, uh, Jack Chapman's descriptions of life on the road in 1868, and it's hard not to strongly suspect that the players were supporting themselves by gambling on their own games. You know, there's a whole retinue of bookies and gamblers and boxers and stuff traveling with them. And, you know, they weren't there to watch them. Uh, so other sources of income. Yeah, uh, no. Dixie no. Taranjo asked about what shape Fitzgerald's gravesite is in and should Saber be involved. I, I can just tell you about Mount Moriah when, when I visited there when I was living in Philadelphia. <clears throat> it is vastly overgrown. It's an immense cemetery and there is no office. You can't talk to anybody. There is a friends of Mar Mount Moriah who cleans up little sections of it here and there, but it, it's almost impossible to get information from them. Yeah, it's, I may not be totally current, but I think it was at some point it was abandoned by its owners. And the last time I checked was a few years ago, you know, uh, people were taking care of the vet, some veterans graves and there were some volunteers, but you know, someone needs to do something about this. And it's kind of shocking. Uh, and it's a, it, like I say, it's a it's a massive cemetery. It's, uh, it's hundreds of acres on both sides of the Schuylkill River. So anyway, it, it would be a very difficult thing. And although there are some uh, 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 groups within Philadelphia trying to do some cleanup, it's just so big a job. It, it it's it's very hard to do. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for uh, uh, an interesting. Uh, uh, bringing somebody we, you don't think of a whole whole lot and what his yeah his, I, think, I think he's very is. under very underrated uh, uh, you know, oh, I just uh, Bob folks also noted that uh, Vice President uh, Johnson was a war Democrat uh, and Lincoln didn't run as a Republican in uh, 64 it was a kind of a fusion ticket mm -hmm. uh, the uh, well thank you very much uh, we appreciate the uh, uh, the time putting this together and uh, <laughs> You know, you always learn something when you, you listen to these things. I, I've, I've heard you speak on Fitzgerald before, but there, there's a whole bunch more about Fitzgerald that's you interesting. Know, thing, uh, for uh, maybe uh, the last thing I'll say about him is we've all been in conversations where we're talking about our, maybe our grandparents or historical figures and the subject of racism comes up and you say, well, you know, you don't really want to judge someone who was born in 1890 or 1860 or 1819 for being a racist because sort of everybody was, wasn't, weren't they? And then you, <laughs> I always think of people like Fitzgerald, you know, not just having different, more modern sounding views, but, but doing it loudly in a popular newspaper with money to lose doing it. And you, you just wonder how true that really was. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Peter, if you'd like to uh, bring us to a close. Yes, Tom, that was a wonderful presentation. It seems that uh, the more you dig, the more you find. <laughs> and uh, literally, I know St. Patrick's on Mulberry Street, and I find it fascinating that uh, somebody had to really influence uh, the Cardinal back then to entomb somebody in the basement of St. Patrick's. Yes. So, uh, you had that, to know somebody. Yeah, that's an incredible uh, find.
and the uh, the interest of John Fitzgerald Kennedy is interesting also. Uh, so I want to I want to congratulate you, Tom, and for for everybody who tuned in this this evening. Uh, Tom will be at uh, Cooperstown this year again. Uh, he's one of our uh, uh, major presenters. Uh, will be in the Grandstand Theater by virtue of his placing high on the uh, uh, jurors uh, selection of uh, research presentations. And he'll be doing a presentation on amateurism, true crime, and baseball. <laughs> if you want to know all about all about Patsy Dockney's criminal career, you'll get that. <laughs> And uh, let me just say thank you again, Tom. Uh, Bob, thank you too for an excellent job of uh, moderating this and everything. Uh, I want to point out that next month, which is actually March uh, the 14th, Tuesday, March the 14th, it's exactly 28 days away. <laughs> we, uh, we have another, our next presentation, uh, which is uh, Paul Brown. And uh, if you get a little bit confused with your schedule, uh, Paul was supposed to originally present in November and uh, uh, he had to uh, uh, re re reschedule his presentation. And uh, thankfully, Jack Bales came in and did a wonderful presentation in, in, uh, in November for Paul. And uh, Jack was already on our schedule to be our March presenter. So now Paul is our March presenter. And he'll be talking about the Douglases, the Caddos, uh, and the uh, era of uh, the age of hope uh, for black baseball in America. So that will be another very interesting presentation and I hope you'll uh, join us. Uh, I apologize <laughs> for not realizing that the second Tuesday of February this year <laughs> happened to be uh, Saint, uh, Saint Val or Valentine's Day and uh, we got to keep that in mind in the future. Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope uh, to see many of you at the thread this year. We have a wonderful, wonderful program coming up. Uh, Bob Folks, uh, if you're listening in still, uh, we I did receive your email and uh, I responded with another email. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for uh, letting me uh, sign up for selections uh, on the fly, uh, Peter. Yeah, just check my email out. <laughs> you got one more pick. <laughs> uh, no, that's uh, the other one's one where I'm presenting. Oh, that's right. Okay, I got you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. And uh, Thanks, everybody. Greatly appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night. Take Good night. care. Good night.